My dear friends, today is the second Sunday after Easter. The second collect is of the Blessed Virgin Mary during Paschal time. The third collect is for the persecutors of the church. This is a beautiful example of the church praying for her enemies, for their conversion, and that they draw closer to our Lord. <clears throat> My dear friends, this is one of the loveliest Sundays of the year. We call it Mercy Sunday. It is a reflection of the universal mercy of Almighty God. And we give him the title of the Good Shepherd, a very worthy title, because a shepherd is someone who is gentle, as our Lord was, someone who is practical, having the responsibility of the care of perhaps hundreds of animals, who is courageous when the wolves come by to snatch one of the sheep, who is responsible to guide the sheep to good pastures, and who is prudent and who is selfless, a very worthy title for our Lord. The names of each sheep is written upon his heart. He knows each one of them. In years past, when there was open range, farmers would brand their cattle so that they could, at the end of the day, at the end of the season, pull their cattle back. Sheep are a little bit smarter than cows. The sheep could recognize the voice of the master in every night as the sheep would intermingle during the day in the grazing pastures. The shepherds would pull themselves apart from each other and call to their sheep, and their sheep would follow their masters. We have the story this morning of a shepherd starting out with a hundred sheep in the beginning of the morning. By an evening, near nightfall, he counted and there were only 99. So this shepherd, as every good shepherd, sprang into action and searched the valleys, the ledges, the bramble, and everything else for that lost sheep. He didn't stop until he found it. Easter is here, Easter is upon us, and this same shepherd searches. He knocks on our doors. He invites us to a good Easter confession. He invites us to a good Easter Holy Communion. Many sheep are lost in the dangers of the world, the ledges of the world, the bramble of the world. Many sheep are lost. Many of them return during this time of the year, a season of mercy being upon us. Many return to their father's house like the prodigal son. On Easter, Christ instituted the holy sacrament of confession. When he said to the apostle, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. Our Lord coming upon the lepers, cured them of their disease. And he gave them a command. He said, go show yourselves to the priest. That was a prototype, a prefiguration of the great sacrament he would establish on Easter Sunday, a prefiguration of confession. It wasn't simply a following of the Mosaic law. The law was put there to prefigure the true sacrament that relieves us of great disease. The good shepherd is friend to the sinner. He absolves each and every sinner by the <coughs> lips of the priest. When the priest says by divine authority, I absolve you of your sins. You learned as children, there are several conditions necessary to make a good confession. You must be sorry for our sins. You must resolve never to sin again. You must do the penance. We must confess our sins to the priest. 
To be forgiven, we must confess. This is an inflexible law. There's no challenge in it. There's no court of appeal. This is an inflexible law of the good shepherd. Adam and Eve, what did they do when they sinned? They blamed each other. Well, the serpent did beguile me and I did eat. That was the woman. And the husband blamed the wife. My wife gave it to me and I did eat. They're blaming each other rather than taking responsibility for their sins. There was no confession there. Cain, after he had killed his brother, I don't know how ignorant he thought God was, when God came to him and said, Cain, where is your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? That's not the answer. That's another question. That was no confession on Cain's part. And because of that, God said you will spend the rest of your life running, wandering the world for a safe place. You will have a mark on you that will keep others from killing you from the same punishment you inflicted upon your brother. King David led a life of impurity for many years until Nathan confronted him. It was only after David was sorry for his sins, it was only after David had repented of his sins and confessed his sins, that that rain fell again upon the land of Israel, that their crops and their animals stopped dying. We see the prodigal son, and I thought this moment, what a courageous man the prodigal father must have been, the father of the prodigal son. When his son came back to him, his son with his head hanging down, lo, he had worldly reasons to come back to dad. He was tired of eating with the pigs, for one thing. But he also realized that even the servants in my father's house eat better than I'm eating right now after I squandered everything that I had worked for all my life, my inheritance. Didn't take him long to spend all that money. He came back to his father and said, Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. But if you would make me one of your servants, he was sorry for his sins. That was a confession. And Mary Magdalene, who lived one of the most scornful lives possible in her time, she was sorry for that. She was filled with shame, but she was not ashamed to appear before the apostles and wash our Lord's feet with her tears dry them with her hair, anoint them with costly ointment. That was a confession. We had the example of the man who was with our Lord the last moments of his life, hanging on a cross just like our Lord. The one was blaspheming. All he wanted to do was to not die on the cross. The other say, we suffer justly for our, for our crimes. For this man hath not committed any. And our Lord promised him because of his sorrow for his sins, he promised him heaven that very day. St. Paul, in his epistles, humbly acknowledges the persecution of the Christians, the appetite of blood in Paul's mouth, Saul's mouth, for the Christians. He wept bitterly like St. Peter, That was a confession. And this brings us to Judas, who betrayed our Lord for silver, a few pieces of metal taken from the ground. He certainly didn't appreciate what life was worth. But how he, Good Friday or Holy Saturday morning, goes back to the temple, throws the money back, says, I have betrayed innocent blood. That was a confession. As a young boy, I had a traditional priest tell us that he believes Judas saved his soul. That's up for God to judge. We can always hope that Judas did. Remorse is not enough, my dear friends. Sorrow is not enough. Resolution is not enough. We must also confess our sins. Christ could have chosen a different way to reunite fallen mankind to himself. 
He could have chosen a different way, but he didn't. He did not. He chose the sacraments for us to save our souls. The sacraments are that ladder which extends from earth to heaven, by which means we may climb our way to heaven through the mercy, merciful grace of the sacraments. Confession has a very physical effect upon us as well. The conscience craves to unburden itself when it has committed a crime. And thus a Jewish psychiatrist rightly understood and, and witnessed that in his hospital where he was in charge of the psychiatric ward, he is recorded as having said, there are hardly any Catholics in here. It's because the Catholics have confession. It's a lot easier going to confession than suffering in a mental ward and being locked behind doors. St. Augustine says, if we're not ashamed to commit sin, let us not be ashamed to confess sin. The church only asks for once a year. We should go to confession frequently. I would encourage you, if possible, monthly. Those of you who are in the school, teachers and students alike, I would encourage you every couple of weeks if you can. Most go to confession frequently. They take to heart what our Lord said, purge out the old leaven, recorded by St. Paul. In other words, make your Easter duty. Wash your garments in the blood of the Lamb, we read in the sacred scriptures. This is a holy season, my dear friends, not just Easter, Easter week, and Holy Week. This is a holy season, a season in which heaven opens up and pours forth grace upon mankind, especially those sorry for their sin. We all believe that Christ rose from the dead on Easter Sunday morning to a new life, in a sense, two days before that Holy Thursday, he was raised to a new life in the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. And we too, my dear friends, are raised to a new life in the sacrament of confession. Holy communion intensifies our desire to do good. Holy communion gives us a relish for the things of God. Even if you have no sin on your soul, the value of Holy Communion, what it does to the soul, to the will. For the church to make a rule, you have to go to communion once a year, is a rule of shame. I remember our priest when I was about 15 years of age, our Irish priest. He told us the story of the woman who was an atheist. And she said to the Catholics, if I believe that that was Christ on the altar, I would crawl to the altar. And so we should do. Each and every opportunity we have, we should crawl to the altar, com the communion rail, the altar rail, receive our Lord, and throne him upon our tongues. One of the greatest joys that I have as a priest is to be here and to have young men like the servers who are going to serve Mass this day or tomorrow, the next day, know that they need to make some preparation so that they can receive Holy Communion. And that gives me a great respect for those courageous young men who make the preparation necessary. Knowing that Holy Communion is the richest part of their week, the richest part of their day. Our Lord said to the lepers, show yourself to the priest. And that's what we do in Holy Confession. God love you. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I ask you to please continue in your prayers, prayers for Mr. Windish, who hopefully will be home in a few days from the hospital after having suffered some blood clots to his lungs and some complications thereafter. God love you and God bless you.